Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for coming. I think you'll all agree that it's been thus far the most remarkable evening. And um, I, I, my name is Wesley Kerr. I, I chair the London Committee of the Heritage Offering Fund, which, which I've been doing for seven years. And um, this is one of the most um, interesting, uh, exciting um, events that I've attended. There's been a veritable susurration. The DNA Friday makes are always um, very remarkable. This, this, I think, has been very terrific. It's been good to see people exchanging ideas and to see audiences wrapped. I, I noticed that Walter Tull was was very popular, and I must say that that's, that was a project in my early years. It's what I think possibly the perfect project um, for the amount of money and um, the amount of outcomes. But it was because it was a very very remarkable story, and and and, I, and, I, and that I think is is the key thing about about the First World War is, is just so many remarkable stories, and, and of course there would be in a conflict which in, involved 70 million people um, actually as armed combatants of whom 10 million were non-Europeans. And it, of course, was a, was a great conflict be between empires. And um, it, it, it will learn much more about the British Empire. So, so without further ado, and to give as much time as possible for, for questions and interactions, um, I'll, let, I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves and what the role of their organization is in the First World War. Thank you very much, uh, Wesley. Uh, my name is Amandeep Madra. I chair an organisation, a voluntary organisation called the UK Punjab Heritage Association. And, and for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, we've been working on trying to bring to light um, Punjabi and Sikh heritage and culture to uh, the UK Sikh population. This year, of course, it's fitting that we focus our efforts on um, the centenary commemorations and, in particular, the Sikh role in the First World War, which which I'm sure we'll uncover some of. We've got a uh, series of panels outside which talk about the disproportionate uh, contribution of Sikhs during the First World War. So how, how many Sikhs? I, mean, I think it's an interesting fact is that the British army in India was actually ten times the size of the British expeditionary force, and about a million Indian soldiers were involved, I think, of which many were Sikhs. In, indeed, indeed. And so this, the, for, from the Sikh perspective, and it's a little bit more than one million Indians, and I'm sure our esteemed historians will give us one point, precise one point three numbers. million. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but from a from a Sikh perspective, because the British recruited in martial races, what they considered to be martial races, then they disproportionately recruited from certain communities, Sikhs being one of them. Um, and so, whilst the numeration is a little bit difficult, uh, what we do know is while Sikhs formed just slightly less than 1% of the Indian population in 1911. Uh, there was something like 15% of the Indian army. Um, I, I think there were 47,000 Indians died in the First World War. And I, 60. 60, okay, so, so that's great. That's a benefit of events like this. And you're, you're also going to use citizen historians as one of the things that particularly attracted us when we looked at your application. So you're going to get to, to today's youngsters to, to look at the history of their ancestors. In, indeed, and, and actually it's relatively straightforward within the Sikh community because we've, um, we've almost set ourselves a little personal challenge within the organisation to find the Sikh that doesn't have a family member who was, uh, who was in the British Army or Indian Army at one point. Um, in their ancestry, and so it's relatively. It's, what's been really good about this project is that the the base level of understanding amongst young people of of their martial heritage is high. The details, not so much. But that's a great entry point for an organisation like us for us to then be able to build upon that and to connect in a year when there's going to be so much media attention on the First World War, so that. Sikh youngsters and, and people living around, you know, in Sikh areas can can say, yeah, we were there too. Thank you, Dr. Kurt Barling. I've been for 33 years, 23 years. I think we were at the BBC together. Yeah. But you are now a very distinguished academic. And tell us about your project. Uh, well, I'm a I'm sorry, I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a professor at Middlesex University, London. Most of you, of course, will have seen me on the BBC over the years. Actually. I've used the BBC platform often as an excuse to look for alternative narratives which might help people share a different sense of their history. And as uh, I went to Middlesex, I decided to 
uh, joined forces with Eastside Community Heritage, which many of you know is an oral history organisation in East London, to look at the history of the Middlesex Regiment. As you'll notice, Middlesex University and Middlesex Regiment share an emblem. And I thought, what a good idea to get young students involved in understanding about a story which many of them, believe it or not, unlike the Sikh community, seem to have forgotten about. Um, what in particular we're going to look at are the contributions of uh, new, what we would now see as new Commonwealth soldiers in the Middlesex Regiment. Surprisingly enough, an awful lot of people seem to make their way to, uh, to Britain. One man in particular who was turned down in many parts of the world because darkies didn't uh, fight in the British services. But once he found himself in Canning Town, he discovered that the Middlesex Regiment were more than happy to have him fight for them. And there were many others like him. So we hope by getting young people to explore, them, young students at Middlesex University, to explore the heritage of the emblem of the Middlesex emblem, they will explore themselves, their association with that history, and uh, help a new sense of narrative prevail. Uh, to date, of course, the dominant narrative, of any of you who were in my speech earlier will know, has been one of plucky Britain uh, making sure that we didn't end up under the jackboot of the Kaiser, keep the boss at large. Well, of course, keeping the boss at large is one story that's been told time and time again. One of the stories that haven't been told is the story of all those Africans and Caribbeans and Sikhs who helped them do it. And we do ourselves and our children and our children's children a huge disservice if we don't share that story. In a nutshell, last point, Wesley, at this juncture, if you've got a white child and a black child and an Asian child sitting next to each other in a class, and they're seeing images of a great conflict which shaped our national discourse and our sense of self, and there are no black or Asian faces in it. That kind of cuts those young black and Asian children out of the story. And the point here is that we need to include them. If you give them a shared sense of past, you give them an inclusive sense of present, and they can share common sense and common purpose for the future. Well said. Thank you very much, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Steve Martin, um, you're here officially for PCA, but I know you're actually an independent consultant. I was reading some fantastic panels that you wrote at the RAF Hendon, um, a rather marvellous project, Pilots of the Caribbean, but, but, but you, you, your work is much wider. Tell us about it. Um, <clears throat> well, very briefly, uh, I'm Steve Martin. I'm a writer researcher. Um, recently, I've been working with the Black Cultural Archives. Uh, predominantly with black cultural archives. Um, I'd really just like to carry on from what Kurt was saying in terms of that sense of inclusion, that sense of feeling a part of a set of narratives, which I think is really central to what a lot of us in this room are concerned with, particularly um, it's part of the mission of the BCA, um, to try and establish a number of other narratives into the mainstream one, um, particularly the stories connected with people of African origin, um, not just those from overseas. You know, we know that there were 16,000, maybe more, um, soldiers, particularly the British West India Regiment who served. We know that there are thousands of um, mariners who died in the merchant service. We know that there were further thousands who were brought over here to work specifically in chemical and munitions factories. But one of the untold stories, or the lesser told stories, um, is that of people of African origin who were born in these islands, who went on to serve. Uh, Kirk mentioned the work being done by the East Side Community uh, Group and the Middlesex um, Regiment. And uh, you mentioned Walter Tom. But it's one of those um, cases where the more you look, the more you'll find. Um, Walter Tom, was he the first? Absolutely not. We know there are others who were before him, like George Bannon, who came from a wealthy Jamaican family who went to Dulwich College and who um, was a second lieutenant in the uh, Royal Field Artillery. We know that the noted Harley Street uh, physician, James Vissian Russell, he joined the Royal um, Army Medical Corps, RNC, in 1908 to 1918. Um, these are remarkable stories and um, keeping 
that had on that particular tiller, looking particularly at people of African origin who were born here and who somehow, <laughs> somehow um, entered the armed forces is a very, very important um, aspect of um, what the BCI and I know a number of other organizations will look at very, very briefly. The other thing which I think is essential over the next four years is to look at the global <coughs> impact of this, particularly for people of African origin, particularly for people in the Caribbean. The First World War was um, the first time it was so, such a large mobilization of uh, men from the Caribbean who were almost uniformly very, very, very badly treated. Um, about eight battalions, I think, of the uh, British West India Regiment um, were taken to Toronto at the end of the war in November, December 1918 for um, um, demobilization. And that's when you had one of the most no notable riots of the First World War. One of the effects of that riot was that um, it led to the politicization of a very large number of those soldiers, particularly those from Trinidad, um, uh, what went on to become Belize, and uh, Barbados, who went on to become uh, central through the Caribbean, which was set up by uh, black soldiers. They went on to be part of the resistance and um, autonomous movements um, within their individual islands. So there are many, many, many stories to be told. But the more interesting one, not to mention the race riots of 1919, which were a direct result of all of this, so I can go on and on and on, but <laughs> I'll just finish on one note. As a result of one point, as a result of the um, um, riots at Toronto, the mutiny at Toronto, um, Caribbean soldiers, black soldiers, were not um, allowed to take part in the victory parade at the end of the war. Astonishing. Um, the Black Cultural Archives are going to be the portal for so many amazing stories, and of course they will be opening in their magnificent new headquarters in June. Um, 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 we've been waiting for a lifetime, and it's going to be just the most fantastic thing. And it, it's a great tribute to the HLF officers who've worked with, with the team there. So, so, so the key portal in the country for, for the First World War, of course, is the Imperial War Museum. As, um, the, the government officially named you as, as the partner. And, um, and also HMF, as, as, as you're our partner. And, and, but, but for us, it's all about inclusivity. I'm, I'm sure it is as well for the government. But um, so, 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 so <laughs> what, 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 what are the key things, Suzanne Bargett, you're one of the leading curators there. What, what, what are the key stories of the First World War you'll, you'll be telling there, apart from the fact that you're going to be completely reconfiguring the museum? But what are the stories, and how inclusive will those stories be in terms of the wider community? Okay, thanks very much. Um, well, around about five years ago, we uh, had a, a, a meeting of our historians and curators looking ahead at the First World War centenary um, and looking at what topics we uh, perhaps needed to understand a little better. And there was a unanimous view, in fact, that the colonial role, the colonial service um, in the First World War was an area where there had been less scholarship and where there had been uh, less acknowledgement, really, of, of, uh, of all that has happened. Interestingly, the museum had done quite a lot on this, and our uh, learning department in particular um, has, has done quite a lot in past years, and uh, there have been an exhibition, there have been uh, learning packs and so forth. Um, but we, in fact, decided to do our own investigation of how far there's an awareness of the role of colonial troops in, in both world wars, in fact, um, uh, particularly amongst the communities for whom it's part of their history. And so we carried out that study in uh, 2012. Those of you who were here for the last session will have seen the film that we made about that project because it really was um, fascinating to realise just how strongly the, uh, the story of colonial troops is emerging as a field in academia, and uh, Shantanu Das, who will be uh, speaking shortly, uh, talked about that um, uh, in our film. Um, we're, we're in the research department at the Imperial War Museum, we're hearing about all these numerous conferences that are going on right around the world, um, and there's just such a high level of activity. And it's interesting to see how many of those are looking either at the role of colonial troops or at um, just the role of, 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 of interconnections between ordinary people. This is definitely a very, very strong emerging area, and it's an area that 
TV is already showcasing, and uh, um, it, it's not altogether surprising that, um, that there's such interest in this for the First World War. Um, but you mentioned Wesley, the uh, Imperial War Museum um, being in a sense the hub of, of activity, the portal. We have a special website, um, the First World War Centenary website, which you can find very easily simply by uh, uh, Googling that term. Um, we're going to be having a hub where organisations who are doing work on the colonial experience can sort of have a presence on that website so that they can sort of talk to each other and be aware of projects that are going on. And we're hoping that that will be um, a really useful thing. Um, we're also setting up a, an online resource showing people how to research their own particular community's history. And Sarah Patterson, who's in the audience um, from our access department, who's done a lot of work on uh, genealogical guides and, and uh, guides to community history in the past, is uh, working on that with us. Um, so that's probably enough for do you, Do you have an open door for community groups that want to work with you? Because it, it, it all sounds very good, but, but there's a danger in telling the very important story of, of, of Britain and the war, which I noticed the BBC is focusing on, um, that, that, that these stories are, are marginalised, and of course they're not marginal. So, so, so how, how open is your door? Well, we're trying to be really helpful. When people come to us and are doing projects, we give them as much advice as we possibly can. The museum's archives are obviously available for anybody to go and look at, and increasingly material can be found online. Um, but sometimes advice is needed as, as to how best to find this material. Um, so, for example, place names are often a very good way of finding immediately material that you're that, on, on this theme. Um, placement names in, in, in Africa or, uh, uh, or India. And um, in terms of us having an open door policy, I, I would say we certainly do our best to really help people and uh, you know, uh, partner them where we are able to. And there's, of course, a big task with the conflicting narratives. I, I think the Australians have been quite complaining about the emphasis on the new Commonwealth. Although I would remind them that some of the countries in the new Commonwealth were British colonies in the 1620s when Australia hadn't even been discovered. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Dr. Alistair Massey, you're, 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 you're holding the reins at the National Army Museum, which is also in the throes of a big heritage lottery fund project. <coughs> the army, of course, had rather a bad rap in the First World War. But, but, but how, how, how important are the diverse stories going to be in the way you, you, you tell the narrative? Right, well the thing about the National Army Museum is almost like we're coming home. And I explain this, this National Army Museum grew out of the Indian Army Memorial Room at Sandhurst. That was our basis. That is, in many respects, the core of our collections. Uh, so, in the past, the, chief, the people who were interested in the Indian Army collections chiefly were the old India hands. But I've worked in the museum for over 20 years now, and I've seen this remarkable change is that as that generation dies out, the people who are now exploring our magnificent Indian Army collections, and indeed, as we, as we speak, National Museum images are flashing behind me, not to precise moment, I have to say, but <laughs> they have been, they have been. Um, the people now looking at it is the, the, new, the new community groups, the growing community groups from the new Commonwealth. And we are working with uh, the Sikh community in particular. We have, we have a display out there. And the great benefit for us is that by engaging with uh, the Sikh community and also the Chinese community, we are discovering things about artifacts in our collection that we didn't know before. They can actually shed a, shine a light onto things. Uh, the epigraphic material, for instance, that was collected by soldiers or great collectors, um, and material that is not, uh, not what we see. The example we have out on display was uh, a mobile togwa, this was war, it was captain in the mutiny, but the inscription now being deciphered shows that it actually belonged to a Sikh warrior before that. So our engagement with community groups uh, is based on the fact that we have under our hand already, historically, uh, it's always been hardwired into our DNA, a kind of expression I know, it's always true, I mentioned about the, in the Indian army, but also the African, the King's African rifles, uh, things like that. Uh, when I went to the museum first, uh, in 1991, we had a new display about the war in Burma. And we put West African soldiers, uh, East African soldiers, to the forefront of our displays even then. So now that we have this wonderful opportunity, courtesy of the largesse of the HLF, and we hope more largesse in the future, <laughs> our, our, 
our redevelopment uh, of the museum, which will see it closer to this, this interior and completely gutted to tell a thematic story as opposed to the chronological one we're telling now, will deal with every aspect, not only of the British Army, but the armies of the Commonwealth and the Dominions, because that is in our Royal Charter. When we received the Royal Charter in 1960, it just said, it didn't say British Army, it said, our army is overseas. And so we've always had this commitment to telling the story of the Indian Army. And I, I brought this out of my bag just to wave around, but um, Gil Marshall Carver's last book was the National Army Museum book of the Turkish Front. And we suggested, if you're going to do a First World War book, talk about the fronts where the Indian Army were in the forefront of the fight against the central powers. And this is because we could tell the story because we had these Indian Army collections upon which to draw. So what this reveals is, is there's so much in our national collections already that tells these stories. Yes. But it hasn't been forefronted, like, like the 4,400 African items in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which they didn't know they had until they did Nature Ledge Project. And it was actually contrary to their collecting policy to collect African items because they weren't considered works of art. Well, so, in this, <laughs> yes. I mean, in this case, uh, the, the material we see, it's true, is chiefly mediated through the European officers of the Indian Army. But they collected, they told stories, and have a, a good oratory, more than a good necessary project in the late 80s and 90s, interviewing officers of the Indian Army, who talked them obviously about their relations with their men of all the, the, the communities within this Indian subcontinent. So, of course, of course, in 1914, a quarter of the people in the world were, were British subjects. Um, but, but do you find that, that, that there's a real connection being made um, with people who wouldn't otherwise have made the connections in the way that Kurt was calling for earlier? Well, indeed, I mean, I was being, I've been networking in this event today, and I was, what I saw in the history of the Middlesex Regiment, well, 20 years ago, we took in the collection of the Middlesex Regiment when the Red Regiment Museum closed in 1992. And so I'm, I'm all the God eager to learn the stories which they're going to tell us from the bottom up, as it were, we have material which we've only scratched the surface of in terms of what we might tell us about the recruitment of uh, minority groups into the British Army, when at the time of people thought this didn't happen, but as we are learning, it did. So, so it's all going to deepen our knowledge of history. And, and Santano Das from King's College London, you're doing a book on, on the First World War and India? Yes, I'm doing a book And on you're doing India. a project as well? Yes, I'm writing a book on... The South Asia and the First World War, but I also edited a book on race empire and the First World War. And more than four million non-white people were involved in the First World War. But more has been written on the four English soldier poets than on these four million soldiers taken together. And this is something that we have to take uh, heed of. But at the same time, I think it's very important to address the complexity of the narrative, rather than just churn out very reductive one-sided stories. And it's also very important to know that from which perspective are we going to listen to the stories, because there are lots of records left by the actual participants. There's an extraordinary collection of sound recordings where we can actually hear these Africans, Indians, Caribbeans telling their stories, singing songs. There are lots of pictures in the Imperial War Museum also in Brighton, and I'm involved in a three-year project called Cultural Encounter in a Time of Global Crisis. And part of the aim of the project is to bridge the gap between academia and community. And I think some of the images that we're seeing, I think they've been put together partly by Anna McGuire, who's part of the project. And this is exactly what we are trying to do, that we need experts to go to the archives, mine the images, and making them available to the public. So that's exactly what we want to do. And beyond that also, I'm also advising, I'm working quite closely with the BBC, and there's a two-part BBC series called The World's War, which is about the involvement of non-Europeans. But it's interesting that, that there's a Jeremy Paxman landmark series, and that there's somehow another series which probably won't get so much publicity. Isn't that, isn't that part of the marginalization? It is part of the marginalization, but again, the story may change, because about the last five years, in academia now, we can't have a First World War conference without the word global almost. And that, you know, I want to be optimistic in 20 years' time, maybe that can change also 
partly because of the conversations we are having. Oh, I agree. I think the story will change because of everybody in this room. When, yes, when, when we did um, lots of projects around the abolition of the slave trade in British ships, to, to get correctly what happened in 2007, we found that that changed the narrative, but it was also a narrative that included everybody. Um, and I think that's what we're going to find with, with this narrative. And I, I, I'd like to throw this open to the floor. We've only got about 15 minutes, but we, there's some amazing, fascinating contributions. I think they're all going to be incredible <laughs> projects. So I'm, I'm pleased that we've already um, funded 50, 50 million pounds of projects in London, uh, out of 45 million in the country. So as ever at HLF, London leads the way. So, um, questions from the floor. We've got some roving mics, um, either to individuals or to general, or to people in general. Um, was that a hand at the back? A lady with long hair? No, you were just waving at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gentleman at the front. In the slightly. I was just interested in that. See lots of photographs there of uh, the Brighton Pavilion and uh, lots of Indians within the compound, but I've not seen any pictures of Indians outside the compound. I wondered if there was some reason for that. Yes, I can't see the... Gentlemen's here. Yeah. Oh, okay, brilliant. I don't know whether you already know, I just want you to tell you more, because there's no lot of... There was barbed wire around the compound, so that the Indian kind of Indian soldiers, the wounded soldiers, they could not go outside the compounds, the ordinary sepoys, because that would have been detrimental to white prestige. Mm -hmm. So while we get to see the soldiers amid the splendor of the Brighton Pavilion, we don't get to see the other side, and I think it's very important to see both sides of the coin. You mentioned that this was a war between empires, 70 million not uh, combatants. Um, the point I wanted to make was the inclusiveness of this process that's going to be undertaken in the next four years is um, the Ottoman Empire, of which 500,000 people, Turks, live in London, across the UK. Now, to be inclusive, how are we going to engage those communities who are the other side of the line? Well, I think very interesting. I, think, I, I don't know if there has been a particular application from, for funding, but, but I think the way the Heritage Lottery Fund works is, is we have events like this, but we, we only decide projects after we get applications. So, so if you know some people who would be interested in doing a project along those lines, or the, or the Turkish government want to work, you know, or however you want to do it, I, I think the, the point is, for the story to be told, probably an institution has to take it up, or somebody has to make an application to us. We, we wouldn't go and say, yes, we want an Ottoman project, but it's, it's, a, very important, it's a very important point. Somebody, somebody asked me earlier, um, <laughs> um, somebody asked me earlier, uh, doing a, a brief interview, Kurt, whose responsibility is it to make sure these stories are told? And I said, well, it's your responsibility, and it's your cameraman's responsibility, and your soundman's responsibility. It's all of our responsibility to take charge of that narrative, because if we rely on others to do it, it will not be done. And there's plenty of evidence to tell us that it won't be done. So it's up to us to energise people at Middlesex University. It's up to me as a professor to inspire my students to lead and for them to take charge of this narrative and then they will spread that narrative. It's all of our responsibility, no one in particular. Don't trust the government because they will not do it. And the thing about lottery funding, what you, you may question the source, but I, I've seen amazing projects for the last seven years. It, it does empower individuals, and we're, and we're funding projects from £3,000 upwards to, to, to come up with projects and, and make sure the stories are told and not just say, oh, somebody else will tell the story. Or if there's something you're unhappy with, complain about it. Anyone else want to comment yeah, on that point, haven't you? Can you just come on the Turkish yes. point? In fact, okay. the Foreign and Commonwealth Office have instituted a series of lectures, and in fact, there are kind of academics and scholars coming from Turkey, from America, to speak on the Turkish war experience. And just this year, in the last one month, two books have been published on the Turkish war experience. And huge amounts of material are being made available, and translation is going on. And it is one of the biggest growth areas. But I think there's a gap between, again, academia and kind of community historians. And that is the next step, to make that material available, which we have already done for the colonial soldiers. And also I'd like to include women, that's the one most important point. When we speak about inclusivity, it's not just having the non-white, but 
civilians, women, children who were equally affected. Well, while the, the situation of women changed massively in this country, it would be interesting to, to see if there were similar effects uh, in other countries. Uh, well, I was just going to mention that I uh, got hold of a, a, um, a, a personal experience account by a, a Turkish woman describing basically life in the First World War in Turkey, and I found myself thinking what a brilliant resource that would be um, for a classroom. Uh, I, I, I think it's, 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 as Chantanu says, it's a question of getting academics to uh, guide communities and also um, for teachers as well to either use their imaginations or, or have these resources put, presented to them. Um, but certainly this particular book wasn't, um, it, it was a little bit obscure and it took a bit of finding. Um, so I think uh, that that transmission of sources and uh, that mediation is something that's really important. A question from the lady there in the back, please. Um, I'm from the Armenian Institute, and this year we'll be commemorating the 1914 uh, First World War, but we're also leading up to our personal um, commemoration for 1915, uh, 100 years since the genocide in Armenia. Um, and I'm just wondering how long the Imperial War Museum are going to be running the centenary. Uh, is it going to finish next year definitely, or will we be able to sort of still be working with you into next year and possibly into 1916? Um, fine. Well, the centenary will continue right to the end of the, of, of the First World War. Um, our programming on for 1915, um, I, I'm not sure what we decided to do about the Armenian genocide. We certainly <coughs> featured it previously in the museum in the Crime Against Humanity exhibition, which ran from 2002 to 2011 or so. Um, but uh, if, if you want to email me, I can certainly make sure that you're kept aware of uh, whatever plans do come to fruition. So, so it's very important, obviously, to, to, to point out that the, the, the projects need to keep flowing because of, obviously a lot of the crucial events were, were, were happening in 1918 or actually 1919 or you know, when the map of the world was redrawn. So, so I think it's important that there shouldn't just be a focus at the beginning. And I think also we need varied projects to, 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 to keep people interested. It mustn't flag. So we've got time for, for two more quick questions. One from a woman, please. And another from one of the gentlemen at the back. So is another woman wanting to... Yes. yes hi, uh, my name is Sunil Butcher. I'm very pleased to hear that a lot of work is being done now to recognize the contribution of the colonial soldiers from India and the Caribbean. But I wanted to just extend the point raised by the young guy about the Brighton Pavilion Park. Because the thing is that uh, I think there was a lot of uh, separation and, race and racism, segregation between the soldiers. So is that going to come out of some of the work? I mean, I was just looking at something um, in the room up here. We said that one of the regiments could not really take part in the Victory Day parades, even though they may yeah. died. So I'm just interested to know, how will it be told overall? And it's obviously a characteristic of Britain and its empire, so, so sh surely these are stories you're going to be telling, that this, this is how it was. Yes, I mean, the, at the National Army Museum, we've never drawn the veil over the difficulties uh, that existed within the, the Indian Army. When we did the exhibition uh, back in 1997 on the 50th anniversary of independence and partition, uh, it is a huge catalogue, and we've got to retire Indian general to write a whole chapter on mutinies in the Indian army. Uh, the satisfaction, both religious elements, uh, political, and also the way, the way that the men were treated. And so the, the story that we were telling from museum, we told in the past and we will continue to tell, is that the Indian Army was a complex uh, organism in which relations were not always harmonious. We only have to look at the sort of Indian National Army phenomenon in the Second World War, but also the sort of mutiny in Singapore, the Fifth Fight Infantry, um, a, blood, a bloody affair, and uh, scores of men uh, shot as a result afterwards. So, yes, the story has been told by the museum in the past and will continue to be told in the future. Yeah. Um the issue is how will the stories be told because these are just such these are just such difficult often unwieldy um episodes um particularly um episodes like the uh, singapore mutiny um and the um who, whoever the speaker was who mentioned the um, uh, ottoman empire this is very unwieldy it doesn't really feed, feed into any sort of 
celebratory instincts which normally feed these processes, they are going to require a lot of sitting down, a lot of thinking, a lot of community engagement. Um, particularly when you come to, um, I keep going back to the Toronto mutiny, someone was mentioning um, issues about segregation. Um, it's not minor segregation that we're talking about. We are talking about individuals a couple of generations um, out, uh, beyond enslavement who are finding themselves having travelled across the world taking a shilling, digging latrines for their Italian enemies. They are captured Italian prisoners of war, members of the Italian Labour Corps. They find themselves doing jobs of that nature. So a lot of what this is so far away from glory that, well, it couldn't be further away from glory. The trick is how this can be told sensibly. But the bottom issue, I think, is really, really fascinating. And it's something that I was briefly involved with and failed to square, trying to do it with um, school children, I can imagine, <laughs> about eight or nine years ago. But um, I think this is really, I think, at the heart of a lot of the processes which will um, inform how this all rolls out. Um, who's going to be making these decisions? Well, you can make the decisions if it's your project and it gets funded. Um, <laughs> let, 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 I mean, the point to make is that, is that they're your projects. It's public money, and we want to spread it around as much as possible. Sadly, we can't fund everything. Maybe here. Yeah. Um, my name is um, Valerie Graham. I just wanted to ask: um, Has there been a list of all the names of? Um, the young men who came up here from the Caribbean or all over the world to come to fight for the what is perceived to be the mother country. Was there a list made of their names? Um, and do, do you does the imperial who would have that list, basically? And um, I don't think there's a, there isn't a well there isn't a single list. But 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 it but there would be lists for individual regiments. And I was at the RAF the other day going through. And they have 40,000, I think, um, and I may have the number wrong, just, just a, a, a casualty list. But it's all the people, but they're, they're not broken down as to what colour they, they were. Um, and you can't always tell from the name. And anyone else on this, Steve? Or Imperial War Museum? But there's not a single list, though, is there? No, no but even there. in the individual list, there are always going to be gaps and omissions yeah. because there would often be cases of ad hoc recruitment. Also, often it's much more usual to find names of combatants than those who served in labor corps or in porter corps. So I think there will be gaps, but I think that's one of the also aims of the centennial commemoration. And I think it should be commemoration rather than celebration. And I'm very grateful for the question from the lady at the back that it should be commemoration and not celebration. Well, I'm sure everybody would agree with that. But, um, but, 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 but yeah, 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 I'm sure everybody would agree with that, really these were terrible events, but, but they must be remembered. And another source for, for finding the names might actually be there may be war, maybe war memorials in the Caribbean, for example, you were asking about the Caribbean, that, 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 that practice here may have been followed there. And I know Norman Manley, for example, um, was, was, was in the Royal Horse Artillery and was given a military medal, because I think I, I mean, he, was, he was an officer, of course, being covered. Just, just a quick point. I, I don't know about the Caribbean records, but in the, for, for Indians, the one thing that really dogs our research is that the Indians burnt their records in the 1970s, the service records of all Indians in the 1970s, to make space in the archive. So, you know, whilst, whilst we may complain about the archive in the UK and access issues, and that's digitisation, we have a huge wealth of information that we're, we're very lucky to uh, be able to access. The, the one record that is uh, particularly particularly complete is the Killed in Action, is the Commonwealth War Graves Commission database. And actually I was at the Menin Gate in um, Ypres just uh, last weekend, and if you stand just outside the town, or just look at the gate from a distance, there's a remarkable thing that happens where people walking through the gate see the tens of thousands of names that are inside. Pause at one plaque, one small space. You see, you see them do it. And they speak, and they talk to each other, and they point out a name, and have a discussion, and then they move on. And I, I went to look at that plaque, and it was actually for the West Indies Regiment. And it's just because it's different. I mean, I don't know if they're black or white or who they were. The point is, 
I think because of the difference, it actually forms a point of focus for people. And it's actually something that I think the National Collections could just, just ponder on for a moment, because I think it's, it's that for, that for you know, a broad section of the community, not just, uh, in that case, black Caribbean, but all sorts of people. I just checked prior to coming to this meeting this, today, I went on the Metal Index card uh, on the National Archives website, and there are 21, 000, over 21,000 SIMs uh, with Metal Index cards. So there, is a, there are resources that you can enterprise in the uh, search. And I suspect probably, I didn't do this, but probably the British West India Regiment, if you key in the Metal Index cards, you can probably find, you're asking about the list of names. See what happens if you do that. No, I think remembering individuals is, is so extremely important. I was so moved to look at these casualty lists at, at RA Pendleton the other day, just, just individual life stories. Last question at the very back, sir. So I took the GCSE history, with this yeah. textbook, and it's the most detailed you can get for GCSE history. And it's about 400 to 500 pages. It's about three chapters in Model 1, and throughout it is one page on one one's contribution. Um, this is in your GCSE syllabus. Yeah, it's the most detailed book you can get. So my I'm question is, why is Black and Indian history been forgotten for the last 100 years? Um, so, so we end where we begun. <laughs> and I would have thought that the whole purpose of this evening's event and of a lot of the projects that we've already funded, like the SEEK project or a million pounds for a project about the Caribbean role, um, is, 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 is to end that um, obliteration of history affecting tens of millions of people. Anyone else want to come in on that? Kurt? Well, I think it's self-evident that um, the dominant narrative of that conflict was defined uh, by the host community of this country. And the host community had their priorities, um, and those priorities shaped that story. We talk very much these days about innovation. Innovation is a really important thing. And here we have an opportunity to innovate the story to change the narrative. And you as a young person doing a GCSE with a book which clearly isn't fit for purpose on that story, mm -hmm. need to find some resources online and take them to your teacher and say, please miss or please sir, can we have another lesson? Because my forebears were there too and it's not reflected in your book. At the seminar this evening to ask such a brilliant question. Okay, so so you found another way of, of, of finding those stories, and I hope you'll spread the message of, um, among your friends and mates at school. And and you might you might apply to, to do your own project because we do specifically do youth-led projects. If there's a pro if there's something you think is miss missing in the youth panel of, of the seat project. Um, they, 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 then speak to our officers and make an application yourself. Um, but we, I mean, one of the outputs of our project is an education yeah. pack. We're going to get it out to schools, yeah. and particularly yeah. schools make their, their their visits. We're going to encourage them to try to uncover the story of the Indian. So side. history is obviously largely about who controls the narrative, and we hope with lottery funding that, that you control the narrative. Um, so, 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 so that's that, that's the end. We're meant to have ended at nine. I'm going to, in a moment, to ask um, our senior HLS colleague, um, our, our, our trustee Atul Patel, to to round off the proceedings. But I, I, I just like I, I, it's probably one of the last big events I'll do. I've been chairing HLS in London for seven years. It's it's been magnificent to be at many events like this and to and to, and to help fund many amazing projects, often involving what what are called fames, which are a ghastly acronym. Um, but, but just to, um, it's, it's in the yeah, BCA will open. There's so many amazing projects. The wonderful project about CLR James is ongoing at the moment. Um, Leon, I know, is doing a great project with his theatre archives. Just so many projects, so many incredible friends. And just on the First World War, it changed my life. Al Alfred Henry Lucas was my foster mother's um, father, and papa. And he used to cut my hair when I was a child in the early 60s. He, um, he had um, sheep shears, I think he was. <laughs> but he, he, was, he, was a, he was a rather firm old man, and, it, and he'd come back from the trenches. He'd been in the Royal Horse Artillery alongside Norman Manley, I'd love to have known if I ever met, for four years, taking um, um, guns up to the front and back, because before the war he'd been a petrol, an SO delivery driver. 
and in charge of stables, and he was, he was mentally scarred by it. In one leave, he told my foster mother that on no account could she go to grammar school because she'd get ideas about her station. <laughs> and that gave her a great passion that when she had foster children, she had about 35, uh, starting in the war, I think I was number 34, that they should get a fantastic education. So the fact that he, he blocked her education, 56 years later, meant that I had a good education. So hopefully we've all been the beneficiaries of that. So I'd like to ask Atul Patel just, just to round off the proceedings, but with, before that, just thank the VNA, thank Michael Murray and the fantastic um, HLF London team who've been so great to work with. Atul. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, and a big thank you to you, because I understand it's your leadership and inspiration that has brought us all here to, uh, to, today. Um, and of course, the immense work you've done on the London Committee as well. What am I going to take out of this? Well, I think a great positive sense that conversations are happening, things are, talk are beginning to happen, and a sense in which that we as trustees should enable more of this uh, to happen in lots of diverse and different ways in lots of different communities. So we're open for business in that kind of sense, and as uh, Wesley said, uh, you know, it's a grant application process and whatever, if you don't get it the first time, do try again. And that kind of effort of filling the form and all of that is nothing compared to what we're trying to commemorate. Okay? So keep at it. And we will do our utmost to, to tell these stories. At the end of the day, that profound question, I think, uh, from the back there, this is a, isn't it a story of how human beings treat each other? And if in 100, 200 years' time, we're still having these kinds of debates, human nature seems to have a way of dividing each other, whether it's on race or other. You know, we seem to find a way of saying we are different and you are somehow bad. And I think that's the kernel of all of this. And that change starts, I think, with me, with us, with us as an individual. So thank you very much. Let's keep this going. And as I said, we will do our utmost to help the process go on. Thank you.